We're going to get started here. Um, our guest tonight is um, one of our planning committee members, which is really exciting. Um, so um, Jen is going to introduce herself in a few minutes. But before we do that, we always have a few house housekeeping items at the beginning of our meetings here to get started. So um, just some housekeeping things to think about. First of all, um, welcome to Zoom. I know we've been doing this for a long time, um, but just kind of a quick reminder here. Um, you want to make sure that you are um, muted on your end if you're not talking. So just make sure that you you're managing any ambient noise around you. Um, if you're in a place where you can put your camera on, we would love it to have your camera on. It's really hard to speak to those sea of black boxes. Um, so if you feel comfortable and you're willing to turn your camera on, that does help um, our uh, expert guest and myself to feel a little more connected to all of you. Um, certainly we understand that, that you know, not everybody's in a place that they wanna turn their camera on, that's fine. We will be using um, uh, breakout rooms as a way to help you connect with one another. If you're new to books, booze, and brains, we do a mix of turn and talk questions and questions with our guest expert. So you'll have an opportunity throughout our time together tonight to get to chat with one another um, in small groups. And so we'll take care of that um, here in a few minutes. When you get invited to a breakout room, you should see a pop-up on your screen. If you're on your phone, it might be minimized at the bottom. Just go ahead and accept that invitation. You'll magically be Zoomed, um, pun intended, to your breakout room. And um, you'll have to unmute yourself when you get there, and then you'll have a chance to talk with our discussion question or turn and talk question. Um, um, Joan and Joseph, that is okay if you have no camera, no worries. We're still happy to have you um, and happy to have you connected and engaged. So um, first, we want to thank our sponsors of Books, Booze, and Brains, uh, Indiana Humanities. Kristen is here from Indiana Humanities tonight. Thank you so much for supporting us. Um, March for Science and Indiana Sciences, that's Rufus Cochran, um, who is listed as Indiana Sciences on your screen. And um, he handles the live stream um, on our Facebook page. So thank you, Rufus and the Indiana Sciences group. Um, and then Central Indiana Science Outreach as well is another one of our sponsors. And then lastly, the, Indianap the Indiana Indianapolis Public Library. Easy for me to say. Um, all right, so I think that that's it as far as um, as far as housekeeping items go. Um, let's go ahead and get started, and we will have our um, expert guest introduce herself, and that'll give us a chance to talk about this really exciting book, um, all about the rise and fall of dinosaurs, and Steve Brissett Brissetti's great work. So, Jen, do you want to introduce yourself? I know you're a frequenter to Books, Booze, and Brains, but it's great to have you as our official expert guest tonight. It's Krista. Yeah, it's a bit weird to be on this side because I won't be the one answering the questions at the end. Um, so I'm Dr. Jennifer Renee. I'm the lead paleontologist and manager of the Natural Science Collections down at the Children's Museum. So for those of you who haven't been to the Children's Museum since your kids were young, um, we actually have a fully functional collections. It's fully accredited. We have specimens that we do research on and use for exhibits. We have a full preparation lab where we're prepping real fossils that we go up and dig ourselves. So uh, when you're going down to the lab and you're talking to people there, to quote John Hammond, we're the real miracle workers of, uh, in this case, Mission Jurassic, not Jurassic Park. Um, so I'm kind of a classic paleontologist where I was that kid that they're like, oh, they'll grow out of that, that dino phase and I just never grew out of that dino phase. Um, that in Lego and believe it or not, I get to use Lego in my day-to-day -day job. So uh, there you go. And warning to all those parents who have the kid that that's just a dino phase, it might not be just a dino phase. Um, I think what really drew me into paleontology as well is I like learning new things. I like learning about different kinds of things and I like not knowing all the answers. So with paleontology, you have this ancient ecosystem where you don't have animals that are exactly the same as today. You can't go out and look at them. And so you have to MacGyver your way through things. I think most paleontologists, no matter what part of your job, you have to be a good MacGyver. So I got to get a two-tongued block out of the field and I've got plaster, burlap, and a bobcat. How do I do it? I've got a dinosaur that all I have is three bones. I got to try to figure out which group it belongs to. I need to figure out how many dinosaurs are in this area, but I'm limited to scraps of fossils. And so I really like that problem solving and what that allows you to do as a paleontologist then is you've got to reach out to all these different disciplines. So a lot of paleontologists tend to be interdisciplinary. And so you'll find us teaching geology, veterinary science, medicine, engineering, because we have to reach out to all these different fields to help us 
So not only do we get to play with some really fun toys, which Steve kind of talks about a bit in the book, but you also get to meet some amazing people that you become lifelong friends with. So we're those people that have like that, that list of friends are like, oh yeah, I've got a friend in the UK who does this random thing. I got a friend in Brazil who does this random thing because you've had to reach out to these people and ask about how you're gonna solve these, these questions. Cause that's kind of ha what happens. You have a question and then you have to say, okay, how am I gonna answer this question? And you have to reach out to a whole bunch of different people. And that's really one of my loves is to just always have these questions and then to try different kinds of things and to travel all over the world to try to answer these questions. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. And my favorite dinosaur, if anybody is interested, um, I like Allosaurus and Deinonychus. So for those of you who know what they are, good job. That's awesome. And I'm sure we'll get more into that um, a little bit later. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more? One of the things I loved about this book was hearing about um, like hearing about the author's sort of path to his career. Can you tell us, I know that you kind of mentioned that as a kid, you were really excited about this stuff. Can you talk a little bit more about what your career path looked like, just so that folks who maybe are not familiar with um, your background can learn a little bit more about it and how you might take on a career like this? Sure. And um, actually, kind of ironically, uh, my mom and dad are on this as well. Hi, mom and dad. Um, so they supported this love from when I was very little. I, I'm from upstate New York. We don't have dinosaurs, um, but we do have kind of the same fossils that you find in Indiana. So your corals and your shells and that kind of stuff. Um, so started just kind of collecting fossils around. I think when my parents redid their garage, they found like a ton of these random fossils I collected when I was five. Um, so just collecting these fossils and then, you know, going on trips to different museums to see the dinosaurs. I was the kid who taped all the dinosaur specials. Uh, we were actually very lucky. The geolog geologist emeritus for New York was in a little rock shop in Kinderhook. So I could go to him and ask questions because he actually taught my favorite paleontologist. So I was able to like have these conversations with this uh, geologist about, you know, my favorite paleontologist when he was his student. Um, when I was in high school, we had a program that was to show students how to kind of go about doing science. So you found a mentor and you did an actual science project and it was for three years. And for that, I went to the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia because my dad found an article where they had just described a new dinosaur from Egypt. And he's like, dinosaurs, Egypt, two things she loves. And a lot of my family's from around that area. So they kind of dropped me off one summer, not knowing what was gonna happen. Um, and that became a really pivotal point in my career because Philadelphia, I joke that they hatched me from an egg there. Um, I started there as a wee intern and I continued to go back working with those people in the field, um, in the preparation lab, and they continue to support me to this day. Um, it's a really tight knit group. Uh, if anybody doesn't know the history of, of paleontology, Philadelphia is kind of where vertebrate paleontology started in the new world. Um, and I just had a great group of mentors became lifelong friends. Uh, and I actually ended up doing my master's at Temple University in Philadelphia and that tied in more as well. Um, but yeah, we, we've kind of dispersed into the wind but we still call ourselves the Philly group. Uh, so whenever we go to conference like, oh, there's the Philly group. So we became this really tight knit group of people that I can turn to now. Um, so I'd say Philadelphia really helped drive that passion. Uh, and then I, uh, between my master's, I was looking for a PhD program and I was having a very hard time because I am not a stereotypical paleontologist. Um, I don't do what Steve does, which is sodomy, cladistics. I don't do that. I don't put zeros and ones in a computer. Um, my specialty is in paleopathology. So injuries, diseases, infections in fossils uh, and also bone chemistry. Um, so I didn't really fit in anywhere. I was very lucky when I did my master's that I had someone who was pretty much a mirror image of me um, who let me kind of go. So I ended up doing my PhD in Manchester, UK, which is another tie-in with this book. So yes, I did my work, graduate work over in the UK. Um, so I was able to go over there because that group was really starting to tie in all these different disciplines of how you answer these questions with some really cool techniques. So uh, we were using the synchrotron, which is basically a high powered X-ray source to look at chemistry, original chemistry in fossils and extant animals um, and micro CT scanning. So actually one of my good friends, Charlotte Brassi is mentioned in this book. Uh, 
and then uh, Carl Bates and um, Peter Falkenham were also there when I was there. So it's nice to nice to see some of the people I know in the book. Um, but from Manchester, I got to meet a whole slew of European scientists, try some whole different techniques, um, and really let my curiosity just fly out the window because I had all these different people that I could turn to. Uh, and then after Manchester, I moved back to the States um, and I ended up in Indianapolis where ironically right down the road at Newfields, there's someone who uses similar techniques on art. And so now I'm still doing stuff and getting to talk with them as well. I think that that's helpful because I think it does give a sense of the field of paleontology, which we learned through this book, is a lot more, I think, diverse in terms of method. And, it, you know, we think of it, I think, at least I do anyway, as somebody who's not in the field, it's kind of, a, it's already a specialty. But it sounds like, like many other fields within it, there are subspecialties, and those subspecialties come from where you trained, where you're physically located, and kind of what your goals are, what kind of research questions you are asking. So can you talk to us a little bit about kind of day to day now, what your work looks like? It sounds like you do a lot of collaborating, but it sounds like you do some research as well. Yeah, so when I'm not doing the fossil preparation and maintaining collections, and uh, for any of you who have been in the know-how of the museum, you know that we just closed our dinosaur hall because we're going to be putting in a whole new exhibit. So we actually had to take all of our fossils off so they don't get damaged during construction. Um, so we've been prepping fossils for that, designing the exhibit, getting that ready. Uh, I've been doing some research with various groups, um, still mostly in paleopathology. So again, injuries and diseases. I joke I'm not specious. So for instance, my last paper was on um, acromegalia in a hognose badger. So I also do modern animals because you can't say anything about fossils if you don't know what's going on in the modern animals. Uh, I'm also doing some stuff on a uh, pathologic skull from a northern bottlenose whale, which I had to reach out. And now I have somebody from Brazil because said, I don't know whales. <laughs> I know this is messed up, but I don't know whales. So I, I now have some lovely collaborators from Brazil and Peru who helped me with that. Um, we've got some really interesting, uh, to be scientific, messed up um, caudals, so tailbones from some of our duckbill dinosaurs, uh, the museum dug in um, South Dakota at the Ruth Mason Quarry for about 16 years. So we have a whole slew of these giant duckbill dinosaur bones and several of them have this really odd thing that nobody knows what's happening. So that's gonna get looked at. Um, and then as far as the chemistry goes, I'm working with, um, I have a good friend at the Stanford Synchrotron uh, and we're working on a couple different projects. Again, not just dinosaurs. Um, so a whole slew of different, not only trying to figure out chemistry of biological processes in different fossil and extant animals, but also looking at how fossils actually fossilize, because that's still a really big question of why some things fossilize and some don't, and what are the processes that go into that. And that's become an even bigger question now that a lot more people, like my research group, are trying to look for that original chemistry, because you want to know, okay, what's happened to it in the 150 million years that might have changed that. So what do you have to take into account when you're trying to find that original chemistry? Um, so believe it or not, it's not a simple straightforward of you go from bone to fossil. We, we still aren't 100% sure what's going on. So that's actually a perfect lead in um, to our first turn and talk question. So thank you. I didn't even hire you to do that. Look at that. Um, so our first turn and talk question um, will give us an opportunity to think about kind of how our perceptions were changed by this book. And I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat as well, because um, it's got a page reference to it. Um, and I always like to um, kind of use the, the exact text from the book when we're doing some little stimulus material. So this is from page 75. Um, and um, Dr. Brusetti says, dinosaurs were the chosen ones. It was their manifest destiny to take on the weaker species, best them, and establish a global empire. And I love that because I felt like he's talking about this, like a Marvel movie or something, right? Like there's this, like you see this really great kind of origin story. So I think that at least for me, before I entered this book, I think I thought of dinosaurs as sort of this evolutionary dead end, right? Like that there was, you know, there was a catastrophic event, it kind of all died out. That was sort of where things end. But it sounds like there's a lot of evolution that's happening and what we know in terms of how dinosaurs did develop over the 150 million years that they were here on the planet. 
So my, I guess, short, short form of this question is how did this book change your perceptions of the ways that dinosaurs evolved? And you should be able to see the chat as you head into your breakout rooms. So I'm going to go ahead and um, assign breakout rooms now. You should have about um, four or five people in each of your breakout rooms. So again, when you get that invitation, just go ahead and click accept. You'll head into your breakout rooms. We'll keep time here in the main room and we'll give everybody about a minute warning when it's time to come back to the breakout room or from the breakout room. When we come back to the main room, I'll just ask for your comments and then um, we'll uh, jump into Jen's comments as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms. And um, once you get that invitation, just go ahead and accept that. And we'll see you back in um, about 10 minutes or so. All right. Let us know if you have any trouble. We're here. If you have any tech problems, happy to help. Right, Jen. Thanks um, for that first answer. That was great. I think that that really helps our folks get a sense of kind of where, where you are in terms of thinking about these things. So um, we've got some folks that have decided to stay in the main room. Again, if you want to hang out in the main room, no worries here at all. We're just going to keep going with this question and then you'll unfortunately hear it twice if you hang out here in this main room. So um, it, obviously for you, this question is going to look really different than our participants, right? Because you have a sense of the field. But if you're thinking about sort of telling this story of the way in which dinosaurs have evolved um, over that 150 million years that they lived here on the planet, um, can you talk a little bit about how the field's perception of dinosaurs' ev evolution have changed or has changed over time? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. And I think we see this in a lot of fields where actually the culture of the time reflects is reflected in how we interpret the data. So for instance, this whole idea that dinosaurs related to birds is actually very old. It's, it's back in, in the early to mid 19th century. Um, and then it gets changed once you get into about the Victorian era because they're viewed as lizards and lizards are slow and stupid and there's no way they can be viewed as birds. Um, so you can really trace kind of what the culture was by how we perceive dinosaurs. So the same with them being a success being versus being a dead end. Again, the Victoria era is like, oh, humans, humans are success and these things aren't around anymore. So obviously they, they're a dead end and they didn't make it because they were so slow and stupid and yada, yada. Um, so it's, it's interesting because you'll, you'll get these peaks and troughs of what people think. And what's interesting is um, sometimes you'll, you'll have something and then it'll go away and then you find a fossil that tells you, oh, it's there and then it goes away. So the, the classic one I think for paleontologists is uh, the sauropods in swamps. So it was like, oh, they were in swamps because they were so fat that they couldn't walk around. And then we're like, no, no, according to a lot of the fossil finds and the footprints, they didn't live in swamps, they're perfectly fine doing this. And then one of the first dinosaurs I worked on was a sauropod that was found in a mangrove. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's interesting because uh, paleontologists have to be very humble because you realize that, um, you know, you might say something now, but in 10, 15 years, there might be a fossil, there might be a technique, there might be, you know, something that comes out and just completely wipes your slate. Um, and in fact, there's even things with modern animals that that happens as well. And so sometimes what will happen is we're like, oh, obviously the dinosaur did that because X animal does that. And then the zoologist go, actually X animal doesn't do that. And we go, oh, <laughs> well that just turned everything on its head. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that is an evolving field. <laughs> I think that's interesting, right? Because that, I mean, you know, the work that I do around science communication, we, I think this is one of the big kind of mis misconceptions that the public has about science, right? Is that there are some facts that we feel very strongly are in, in fact facts, <laughs> right? There are some things that we, you know, things like the, like the theory of evolution, right? I think a lot of times when folks hear theory, they think, oh, it's not yet been proven or someone's trying to prove it. Like, you know, all the evidence, 
points in this very particular direction. Um, you know, so we feel quite sure about that. That said, there are things that we're not totally sure of. And I think that that's a really good point that when we think about how we talk about science, that, um, you know, this perception issue um, is, you know, informed, as you said, by the culture in which those discoveries are made. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there, we have the added thing, archaeologists have this problem, we have it tenfold where you're seeing a snippet, right? The fossils are crushed, or they're not complete, or um, there's multiple animals in one section, or one's young and one's old, so we're, it's like having that film reel, and you've only gotten snippets, and you don't even know which order they go in. Um, so that's another reason why it could change is because, so the, a good example of that is a dinosaur called Therizinosaurus. Uh, they look like pot-bellied geese with Edward Scissorhands. So when they first found them, they didn't find them with the head and they're these huge claws. I mean, they're like almost oh, three feet long and people are like, oh, that's obviously, and all this feature said, oh, it's a theropod, it's a meat-eating dinosaur. And then they found the head and they went, okay, so it's a meat-eating dinosaur without teeth um we've got to rethink this so that's another reason that that this stuff happens and then um also as far as cultural goes it's people opening up more to collecting fossils in different countries and also just uh the internet allowing us to know about these different fossils that might be in a small museum or in a museum that's um, you know, from a country that we, we don't associate with dinosaurs. So that's one reason I really like this book is he talks a lot about fossil locations that I don't think people associate with fossils. So, you know, you're in Poland, people are like, what, Poland? Poland's got fossils? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so the kind of being more connected culturally has also allowed us to change our views on science because we're learning about more specimens and finding more specimens to kind of fill in those gaps. And filling in those gaps means that you have to sort of tell the story in a different way. So how do you do that at the Children's Museum where you're, you know, your primary audience is an audience that looks for a story, right? They, they sort of hang on to those relatively simple stories. So how do you kind of work to talk about the idea that, um, that the science is evolving um, to folks who are kind of looking for um, that solace in the black and white? Well, they, first they always assume that we found all the dinosaurs. And we're like, no, we go out every summer and find more. Um, so we jokingly say that's job security. <laughs> um, and what we try to tie in at the Children's Museum, because again, we're, we're kind of sparking that interest in science for the next generation, is we like saying, we don't know. And you know what, like 10 years ago, nobody was using, well, I guess it was a little bit older than that. I'm gonna show my age now. It's like 20 years ago, no one was using a synchrotron to look at fossils. We didn't know that was a thing. This is why museum collections are so important. We didn't know we'd be pulling DNA from mammoth bones. We didn't, you know, there's all these things we didn't know about because we had new techniques. So I like telling the kids like, hey, when, you know, if you want to be a paleontologist, there will still be plenty for you to add to the science. I said, you might, you know, what I'm saying right now, you might come visit me as an undergrad 10 years from now and say, hey, Dr. Renee, guess what? That just changed. And I'll be like, See, you too, because I think that's another thing, like the kids are like, oh, I can't be a paleontologist. They, they have to know all that stuff already. No, guys, there's, it's still changing. And that's one of the things that I also think helps kids get interested in STEM through paleontology is this fact that like, we still have all these things that we're not sure of or that we could slightly tweak or we wish we had another fossil. So it's like, no, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, we're digging in an area that's been dug for 150 years years and we're still finding stuff you know so it's also not just you have to travel to these far off places that no one's ever been to you can go to wyoming mcdonald's down the street well for us two hours away but mcdonald's close by and you can still find fossils and we're still finding new fossils in these areas because we're also getting better at identifying things so for the longest time we didn't realize dinosaurs had feathers so a lot of them were probably just prepped right off the fossil because they didn't know what they were looking for and now that we know this, we go, okay, slow down. Same with, okay, scrap material. We can start doing destructive analysis. We can do histology. We can do chemistry. We can do ancient DNA or ancient proteomics work. So there's, there's this whole slew of stuff. You could stick a new student in a museum collection that had been looked at by 50 other scientists and they'll still probably find something new. Thanks, sorry for the delay there. I was giving everybody a little two minute warning in their conversations. 
Um, when we have everybody back, I would love it if you would um, offer some of those examples that you just offered in the Children's Museum in terms of thinking about that change. And then also talk a little bit about um, kind of how you've seen the field evolve over time and the relationship between culture and the field. I think that's a really interesting thing that I didn't quite understand from the book that I think will be a good add. And I, so you'll appreciate this, Krista, because one of my friends, her PhD was on um, science communication and she did ancient DNA studies. And do you know that ancient DNA studies, like overall, not just dinosaurs, spiked right after Jurassic Park came out? So interesting, so, right? Yeah. Park coming out, everyone went, huh, you know, that's just crazy enough. Maybe not with dinosaurs, but maybe we could do that. And the other thing that it helped them with. As we all know, when you're writing grants, it helps to have something sexy. So people will be like, you know that Jurassic Park? Fun me and maybe you'll get a mammoth. <laughs> she did a whole, her whole PhD was on how uh, kind of culture affected ancient DNA studies for paleo. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not terribly surprised. It's funny, you know, I spend a lot of time as I train scientists to kind of communicate with the public, always talking about the idea that um, you know, as scientists, or in my case, a social scientist, we want to believe that we're not affected by those things, that we only use data to make decisions, but we all know that that's not true. And I think it's interesting to think about, for example, how fields evolve based on um, how the public conversation evolves and changes. Yeah, I mean, we actually have this neat kind of pseudo experiment, I guess, of the generation that grew up with the original Jurassic Park and now we'll have the generation that grows up with Jurassic World and just how the science of those two has changed, which I hate to say it, but the science in the old world. <laughs> yeah, these, I, I have heard that from many folks that the uh, the new ones are not as accurate potentially as the older ones were. Um, all right, so everybody's gonna come back here in just about a minute and then um, I'll have you, Jen, kind of talk about some of those things that we chatted about briefly. We'll hear from some of the groups and then we've got another question for you. Welcome back, everybody. You should be coming back to this main room muted, but if for some reason you happen to get unmuted on the way, don't forget to mute yourself. Um, happy to have you all back here in the main room. So while you all were gone, Jen and I had a really great conversation about um, the relationship between science and culture. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about how the Children's Museum tells the story of um, of how kind of how the field of paleontology has evolved. So um, lots of really good conversation here in the main room. We'll talk about that, and then I'll give you all an opportunity to kind of share how your conversations went in your room. So Jen, do you want to start by talking a little bit about um, sort of your perceptions and some of the, the sort of research field perceptions about how sort of culture influences um, the kind of scientific discoveries that happen? Sure. So kind of the, the main ones that you see is, first off, just the overall culture. So I give the example, um, dinosaurs with feathers and related to birds is not a new thing. Uh, this was something that was talked about way back when with Pope and Marsh and Lighty in early 19th century. Um, but then it kind of went out of fashion in the Victorian era when it's like dinosaurs are big lizards, people are the best thing ever. Obviously dinosaurs were too stupid and that's why they went away. And then it kind of came back up as we were starting in about the 80s to really start looking at like intelligence of animals and that kind of stuff. And so my favorite paleontologist is one of the guys uh, he's mentioned here, John Ostrom. Um, and that's why he's one of my favorites about, hey, you know, these guys are related to birds and birds are pretty cool. So maybe we should start treating them like birds. So you kind of got this and it was all based on the cultural the time about how you interpreted the data. And then another good example, I have uh, I have a friend who actually did her PhD studying kind of science communication and culture and how it affects um, science. And she looked at how culture affected ancient DNA studies. And when Jurassic Park came out is when the spike in people doing ancient DNA studies happened. Um, so it was partially people going, hey, I mean, that was a crazy idea I had. So maybe, you know, I won't try the dinosaur, but a mammoth could be doable. And then for any of you who have ever written a grant, it was also that, hey, grant committee, remember Jurassic Park, huh? That's pretty sexy. Maybe I could do something like that and get some money. So if you actually looked at the number of labs doing ancient DNA studies, it really skyrocketed after Jurassic Park came out. So you can all thank Michael Creighton for all of those studies that came after it, really. 
And you were talking as well about sort of some of the changes in the perception of um, of like fossils themselves, right? The idea that as you discover more about a particular fossil, that that your um, perceptions of what that animal was like, um, how you know how it lived, how it ate, how the, all of that really changes. Yeah. So the the other thing with paleontology is it's it's like archaeology except ten times worse because our things are even older and they're animals. And anybody who studies animals knows that Mother Nature likes to throw you curveballs. Um, so the other problem is we have these snippets, right, that we're trying to piece together for this animal. So for a lot of times with dinosaurs, uh, we consider it a skeleton when it's about 10 to 15 percent. That's a good day for us. And remember, this is just a skeleton. So think of how many animals out there, like a tiger versus a lion. It is very hard to tell just based on the skeleton. OK, but we get snippets of this. So sometimes what, else, what also happens is you have part of an animal and you think one thing and then you CT scan it or you find more of it or somebody from another institution is like, hey, well, I have this and you have to rethink about it. So one of the classics for paleontology is uh, this dinosaur called Therizinosaurus, um, which looks like a giant pot bellied goose with Edward scissor hands. Uh, it's a theropod, so it's part of the meat eating dinosaur group, but it, it's toothless. So when they first found it, they didn't find the head and they just found these huge claws and like, oh, this is a predator. And then they found more of it and they went, well, it looks kind of like Baloo from the Jungle Book with the goose head and these big claws. So and we still don't know what they eat. Some people think they're insectivores. Some people think they're herbivores. We definitely know that they're not going down and killing things like the Indominus Rex in Jurassic World, but that's only because we were able to find more fossils. Uh, there's also a fossil um, if anybody's been to the American Museum of Natural History, where the, all they had were the arms. For the longest time, all they had of this dinosaur were the arms, and they had to make guesses on that. And they finally found more of the body. And that wasn't too long ago. That was less than 10 years ago, I think. So it's, it's this thing that you think you know. And then someone's like, well, actually, I just found this. And you go, oh, so in paleontology, you have to have a little bit of humble pie to know that Anywhere from six months to 10 years from now, someone's probably going to prove you wrong. Well, and that presents a, a particularly, um, I think, intractable challenge for the folks at the Children's Museum who are, you know, uh, I was saying earlier that, you know, for a person like me who studies science communication and, and you know, teaching of communication, that a lot of times young children want to look for that sort of black and white answer, is it right or wrong? And I think that that is a really hard story to tell to kids, right? That, that there are some things that we know that are, that are as true as we can get, but then there are some things that we're still questioning. And so you had some good ideas for how the Children's Museum just kind of talks about that uncertainty with kids. Yeah, so um, one of the fun things is that we, and this is for adults as well, everyone thinks we found everything and we know everything. So everybody gets really excited when we say, no, 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 we go out every summer and we're still finding fossils. And this is an area where people have been collecting fossils for over 150 years. We're still finding fossils. Um, and one of the, you know, the main goals for us at the lab is to inspire interest in science, especially for the youngins, you know, to hopefully get them into the STEM fields. So to say, hey, yeah, there'll still be dinosaurs fossils around when you're an adult. And we're still learning new things. I'm, I'm using techniques now that were unheard of, you know, back when I was an undergrad. Um, and as things are, I joke that we're also those people, you know, we can't afford the new iPhone, but once a couple of variations go out, we can get the, the older version. So things like micro CT scanning, because we can't use medical ones. We have to use the ones that the engineers are using to punch through rock. Um, all these different techniques that we didn't have available 10, 15, 20 years ago, which is why Natural History Museum collections are so important because you never know when you're going to be able to do this stuff. Um, so just having those techniques available to do that or finding these new specimens as more and more countries are showing all of the great dinosaur fossils that they have and, you know, we're collaborating more globally, all these questions we can answer. So I love telling kids, hey, if you become a paleontologist, you could come back and if I'm still here, you could say, Dr. Renee, you're wrong now. And that's cool. Like that's job security for all of us that we're still learning new things and then it's a constantly evolving field. So I like telling kids, hey, I don't know all the information because I think kids get scared and think that adults do. And so it's nice for an adult to say, I don't. And what I like about my job is that I'm still learning new things and finding new things and you will be too. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think that that narrative, again, that idea of, you know, sort of um, lifelong learning, all of those things really probably resonates really well with many of your guests. So I would love to hear from some of the folks that were chatting in the breakout rooms about how this book may potentially have changed your perception of the way that dinosaurs evolved. So if you um, had an interesting conversation or an interesting question that came up in your small group and would like to share that with the group right now, you're welcome to do that. And there are two ways. You can use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and I can call on you. Or if you can't find that button, you're welcome to just turn on your mic and, and mention something. We're happy to hear from you. So how did this book change your perception of how dinosaurs evolved over time? Go ahead, Kim. You'll need to unmute yourself first. There are several things. Um, the fact that it that some of the dinosaurs, you know, grew into dinosaurs within 30 years. Um, there were perceptions of the feathers, you know, the fact that, that they're not just scaly lizards, basically. We had a really interesting conversation about how some of maybe we don't maybe we haven't found any sea dinosaurs and there might have been sea dinosaurs just the the chemistry of the rocks that we're finding the um, dinosaurs in might be more important than say you know what existed and what existed what existed is what we're what we're finding is based on the chemistry and the geology of the area that we're finding them in so we might not be able to find things in the open ocean at all, um, but that wasn't really in the book, but there was, you know, talk about that in our group that maybe it's not that there weren't any ocean type dinosaurs, we just aren't finding them because the ocean areas, you know, have no fossils and that grew out of a conversation of, are there any dinosaurs in Indiana? We were underwater, so there's no, there's no um, dinosaur bones. There might've been dinosaurs here, but there's no bones being found. Um, did anybody else in my group have anything to add? Thanks, Kim. Okay. Um, let's see, Jennifer, you want to add something? Go ahead. Um, and I'll get to Anthony and Bill right after that. Um, you know, the whole evolution of dinosaurs existed for so many millions of years. And um, he got into how the continents, well, continent broke apart into continents. And you know, obviously there's fossils from all over the world, but I hadn't, as much as I've ever thought about different species in different areas of the world, the same thing never really occurred to me about dinosaurs. And so that I found very fascinating with the, the minis on the islands in Europe and arthropods staying successful in South America, not so much in North America. That was all very enlightening. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay, Anthony, you're next and then Bill. And you'll just want to unmute yourself, Anthony, bottom oh, left. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I'm part of Jurassic Park generation. So that's pretty much, you know, my the limit of my knowledge before reading this book. But similar to Jennifer, I think a big takeaway from my reading is how much geography impacted evolution. Um, and you don't even really think about that. But again, hundreds of millions of years, drifting continents, and how much, you know, the, those land masses and the locations they were in um, influenced how dinosaurs evolved. I agree with you. And I think that the author does a great job of sort of creating that arc for you around kind of how the, you know, how the geography really shaped the way in which the, the dinosaurs were able to live, were able to eat, how they evolved over time. So I agree that was one of the big um, changes, I guess, in my perception. Okay, Bill, your ideas? Sure. Um, so I was kind of mentioning about Gondwana land when it was splitting up, um, that the dinosaurs maybe had gone to different continents, like some went to uh, Australia and some went to uh, South America and some went to North America. And um, I was wondering if that would have affected the development of the dinosaurs very much. And then the other thought <clears throat> that I was wondering about when things fossilize, how much more likely is it that like plants, plant material will fossilize as opposed to animal material because you know the animal fossils are so rare and they're it's illegal to get a lot of them and I mean is it just like ten times more likely you'll find a plant fossil or what? <clears throat> well, part of that is all based on biomass. So nowadays you have more plants than you do animals. 
Um, but it also is dependent on chemistry because certain conditions favor different preservation. Um, so some favor plant preservation more than others. But if you just think of your basic biome, your, your, your greens are going to be more than your invertebrates than your vertebrates. The only reason we don't have too many invertebrates unless they have shells is because they're all squishy um, and very small. Uh, and then the other thing that can affect bias is where they're from. So actually, for instance, um, there weren't rainforests when the dinosaurs were around. They're actually fairly new. But one of the reasons why it's so hard to find old primate fossils is rainforests are really good at recycling material. So if a carcass falls on the ground, it ain't sticking along to get fossilized. Um, and the last part of the bias comes from where the rocks are exposed. So for instance, in Indiana, we don't have those rocks because the glaciers took them all away. I'm from the East Coast where there's a lot of trees and parking lots. So that also covers up fossils. Um, so you have to have like where the animals would live, where they would die and get very quickly, where they're gonna be exposed to the surface. Those, there's a whole slew of these very key things that have to happen to become a fossil. And it makes you really appreciate just how many we do find. Um, because you think of, you know, something like 99% of all life that's ever lived has gone extinct. And if they all became fossils, we'd have skyscrapers of fossils. So Jen, that really kind of leads me to, I mentioned um, to you at the beginning of our prep time that um, I was really excited when I heard a journalist um, ask um, Dr. Bersetti this question, which is essentially, I mean, we've all looked at fossils. Many of us have probably been to museums. We've held them in our hands. Maybe we own some ourselves, but I think it would be helpful for folks to just really kind of have that. Yeah, Jen's like, I've got them right here. I have visual aids right here. So really specifically, if you can kind of help us understand exactly what a fossil is, how you find them, and then I think more specifically, how you know where to look to find them. So really the definition of fossil is just evidence of ancient life. Uh, so most people who are honest probably think automatically of body fossils. So that's, you know, bones and shells and that kind of stuff. But you have ichnofossils, which are trace fossils. So footprints and burrows and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have fossilized poop, you have fossil plants, you can have fossil bacterial mats. So stromatolites, for instance, you can have so there's a lot of different types of fossils. The, the tree of is just evidence for ancient life. Um, as far as how a fossil kind of comes to be, that's one of those things where we thought we knew and then we went, mm, maybe we don't because there's a lot of complicated things that go on. Uh, so kind of the simplified version if we're talking about, let's say a bone um, is, so your bone has two parts. You've got your mineral part, which is why you drink your milk for your calcium. And then you got your squishy part. So the mineral part keeps your bones nice and sturdy. Your squishy part makes sure that when you jump off of the swing, you don't shatter your bones. And this is why when you get older, you're more likely to shatter your bones because you're losing some of that squishiness. Um, your skeleton is also, this is where I'm going to geek out. You can put half the periodic table into your bone appetite crystals because the bones are meant to store things when you need them and release them when you need them. So you're a new you, like something like every seven to 10 years. It varies based on the bone and how old you are and all that. Um, but your skeleton's meant to substitute stuff in. So when your bone gets buried, um, all the squishy bits get degraded out, so they decay out. And as the poor water's going through, everybody here in Indiana has seen your shower head where you have the crystal growth on it. That's happening, but at the microscopic level in the bone. And it's replacing those areas where you have the um, organic bits all the way down to the microscopic level. So like I said, I do paleohistology and because it's such a fine way of preservation, I can still cut a bone and treat it just like a regular bone. I might lose some depending on, again, how well it fossilizes. So what you end up with depending on how old it is. So things like mammoths and such are what we sometimes call pseudo fossils because they're not completely fossilized. They haven't had a long enough time to become a fossil. Um, so it depends how they're fossilized, if there's still original material in there. So that's one thing that's made us rethink how things fossilize because we're finding ancient proteins. I think the oldest ancient protein, it used to be three and a half million. I think it's gone up since, um, but that's pretty darn good. Three and a half million years for some proteins. Um, and I found original bone healing chemistry and then Allosaurus till it's 150 million years old. So we're starting to rethink, you know, what it means to become a fossil. But at the same time, if you go to Australia, they have a good chunk of their fossils that are opalized. 
nothing's in there. <laughs> they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful, but it's just the, the kind of water that was going through, the kind of minerals that we're going through, it just means that they're completely silicified. Um, and that can change just like over time, groundwater can change. If anybody here, you know, you have groundwater. Um, so sometimes even within the same quarry, and we see that at Arctic site um, in Wyoming, that some fossils will be a slightly different color than others or slightly different preservation style or better preserved than others. And it's just how fast were they buried? What's the water going through? Um, and the kind of bone itself. So if you're a nice sturdy bone, you're probably gonna last a little bit longer and have more time for those waters to go through versus a fragile one. Um, but that's that's not always the case. And I won't, there's there's a whole other slew for things like soft tissue preservation. So that you know plants kind of cheat because they kind of have like hard soft bits, but there's a whole thing for plants. There's you know how soft tissues preserve is a whole study. Um, Cause again, we're like, oh, they're just bacterial mats. Oh, whoops, chemistry says they're not just bacterial mats. We have to rethink how, how we look at this. Um, so your basic body fossil is just pour water going through there and replacing the bone a bit by bit. Uh, and this is why when you look at different vertebrate fossils, they can be different colors. So if you go to Dinosphere, when we reopen, you'll notice that um, even with our two different sauropods or two different long necks or from two different quarries, one's like a chocolatey brown color and one's like a black purple color and it's because they're from different quarries where there were different minerals going through at the time. Yeah, that's really helpful to think about, to think about sort of, again, all of those different environmental factors, as well as those you know, individualized factors that help shape how we think of what a fossil is and where it comes from. So I've got another turn and talk question for everyone. And Bill, I noticed that you've got a question. So maybe we'll grab your question on the, um, on the flip side of the turn and talk question. And this one, I think it will ask us to zoom out a little bit. Um, one of the things that I loved about this book um, was just all of the amazing scientist personalities that um, the author brought up, right? We got a chance to meet lots of different scientists with different backgrounds and different interests in the science um, of, of paleontology. And so I've got a little list of folks from, um, from the book that for me were some of my favorites, favorites, just in terms of telling those stories and I'll put those in the chat for you. So my question here is um, kind of twofold. Um, so it's kind of a long chat message if you wanna read it, but the um, asterisks there are just the list of our scientists. So here's my question. One of the things I loved about this book is all the scientists' personalities um, that the author describes. Who is your favorite? And why would it be helpful to include all of these personal characteristics about these scientists? What does that tell you about the field? What does that tell you about them? So I'm gonna um, ship you back out into your breakout rooms and um, we will talk about that for a few minutes, talk about what it is about these personalities that makes this book compelling. And also maybe if you have a favorite, talk a little bit about why you liked that person and what they did. And I'll bring you back in a little bit shorter time this time, we'll maybe go about six minutes and I'll bring you back. And again, the easiest way to grab that breakout room invitation, if you're on a phone, just click the menu at the bottom of your screen and you'll see it there. Um, and you can head into your breakout room or if you would prefer, um, just let me know. And, and if you're having trouble and I'm happy to help you, it looks like some folks have bounced out. We'll make sure to get you in a room here. Give me just a second. There we go. All right. Looks like we've got folks headed into a few different rooms now. And if you hang out in this breakout room, like I said, or hang out in the main room, the biggest thing is that you're just going to hear answers to questions twice. All right. So, Jen, you mentioned that um, that Jingma is now the paleontologist at the Field Museum. That's exciting. Oh, she's a she's a character. She's well known yeah. in the Vert Paleo group. Um, so it's it's funny because, you know. One vertebrate paleontology in particular, like the invert paleontologists kind of shake their heads because we tend to be the rock stars. Um, so they're just like, oh, you don't have a big sample size. You just have the sexy dinosaurs that everybody cares about. Um, but it results in these like larger than life folks that have these backgrounds that you're like, really? Part of it, I hate to say is because um, like in some archeology span positions, you have to 
already kind of be well off to stay in there. So you get, so, you know, for some of the history, especially you get some very eclectic rich people that are just like, I like fossils and I can afford this. So I'm going to go off and do stuff. Um, but, you know, you, you also have some great historic characters that kind of break out of the norm for what we think of a scientist. So, you know, Mary Anning is a classic one of this female fossil collector who's just rocking it in the UK, getting new species named after her. Um, there are several characters throughout history that, you know, um, come from interesting backgrounds. Um, LGBT is really well represented throughout the history of paleo. So if there's something about this field that just draws in these eclectic people and it makes it for a very colorful and interesting group to talk to. What do you think it is about the field that draws folks that maybe are kind of left of center? Um, well, one, a lot of artists are big into paleo and I think it's that love of trying to recreate something that nobody knows. And, and uh, a lot of, we actually rely heavily on artists because that's how the public views our fossils is right. Like you ask any kid what a T-Rex sounds like and looks like they're gonna point to the Jurassic Park T-Rex. Um, so there's, so we do tend to draw a lot of people. And I think because you have to be so creative in this field, you have to think about how you're gonna get things done. Think about how you're gonna answer these questions. You have to be willing to go out in the middle of nowhere and draw pictures to Bedouins of what you're trying to find. And you need to figure out how to mime, I need plaster in Cairo. Like, because you have to be so creative on how you're going to accomplish these different tasks, um, I think that's what another reason why we get this, this good group of people, because we all are thinking outside of the box of how we can do things. That's a really good point, that there's like a really eclectic set of skills that you need to be successful oh, I mean, in the field. I, I, put, I put casters on a crocodile, help put casters on a crocodile today. You know, that's another thing. People are like, oh, you just did dinosaurs. I'm like, no, I also need to know, like, how to drive a truck and I need to know how, like we're doing rigging training for how to lift a two-ton block and I need to know how to program a synchrotron to start doing this work so I need to know physics and chemistry and for when I'm making my histology I need to operate a rock saw so uh, again it's we're MacGyvers that's the best way I can really describe paleontologists whether you're in the field trying to figure out how to get something out or you're in the lab prepping it you know we have tools from a, a dental pick all the way to these very specialized pneumatics that we get from Germany. It's whatever works. It's the, we always say there's no wrong way to prep, like one right way to prep a fossil. Like whatever is gonna work on hand and it's the same with research. So you'll see even just in the same field, so like biomechanics, you'll see 15 different ways that people have tried to answer this question. Like, is this the best way? I don't, let's stick some markers on an elephant and have it walk and let's see if that's the best way. Um, and that's, I think that's again why we become so eclectic because we're like, I don't know, should we try this? Yeah, let's try it. Let's see what happens and some excuse to go play with some elephants and we go for it. Well, and I think as well, one of the things that I noticed as I was reading this book was just the extent to which um, the field is it, it, as you said, it includes art, it includes some level of data analysis, it includes, you know, fossil preparation, um, which is, you know, very fine motor skills, very, you know, very specific to, uh, you know, particular kinds of field work. Um, I think that one of my favorite stories in the book as well is that um, the story about I think this was in this book. I don't know. I've read a lot for today. Um, the story of him going out with a colleague looking for um, fish fossils and then finding the huge footprints. Was that in this book? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I like, couldn't yeah. remember if it was a book or an article that I read. Um, but it's that ability to kind of zoom in and zoom out, right? Like that that's something that I feel like is really um, potentially unique. Yeah. And again, that's, that's why I, I love this field because, you know, I what the friend that I'm sending something to Harvard to, he, he works in the world of computers. He's a paleontologist, but we had him out in the field last year and he's like, this is not for me. <laughs> or at the same time, I'm like, I don't do programming. So, you know, we complement each other and you, that's why you get to meet all these different people. And Steve talks about it a lot in the book of like, hey, I want to know this thing. Hey, you who knows this thing, I'm gonna work with you. And then what happens is you get these very tight knit group of people. Um, so it's, it's funny because we're very, a lot of paleontologists are very protective of their data because we have so limited amounts and grants are limited. But at the same time, you have these very close knit groups. So like I, I joked about the Philly group. 
Um, and even amongst students, I'm, there's a lot of kind of this unspoken, you know, you help each other out. So for instance, uh, one of the big conferences and, and uh, professional groups in North America is the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. And it's not, it's not in their code of conduct, it's nowhere on the website, but amongst the students, there is this rule of the pay it forward rule. And if you went in as the first time as a student and you didn't know what was going on and an older student or postdoc took you under the wing and showed you around, then you should do that for them. And it was very surreal for me to, you know, I, I had a great big brother, Andy Farkey, who's a wonderful guy, an expert in ceratopsians. And it was very odd for him to say, okay, you do that when, you know, when you're more along in the field, for me to then take people who are now professionals and be like, oh, I don't know that person either. Let's just go over and talk to them and just show them around. And so it was this, this knowledge of the students that, you know, we realize that some of these guys have big egos or are very intimidating because of their background, but the student's ability to just say, I got you, we're, we're gonna help you out. Let me, let me go and introduce you to these folks. That's really cool. It sounds like a really collegial, like you said, a really collegial field. Like there's a lot of folks there that are supporting one another. And I think that's, you know, what makes a field, at least for me, makes a field attractive, right? Is the opportunity to be able to collaborate with kind folks who want to help me learn. Yeah. And again, like, it, because there's not a million job positions, you know, if you, if you started within a group, so again, my Philly group, we're now all over the place. So now you have people that you're reaching out to from all these different types of institutions from all over the world that, you know, you met in that one area, but now you've kind of spread to the four corners um, and you're still keeping in touch. You know, I've, my, one of my high school mentors, I contacted about six months ago, asking about fake foliage for an exhibit. So I'm like, I never thought in a million years I'd be contacting you about exhibit design. He's like, I know, crazy, crazy field this is. So it looks like folks are just coming back. Um, I love when that happens. It usually means that folks are having good conversations in their breakout rooms. So my apologies for having to pull everybody out of those great conversations. It's always really fun um, to, to hear how your conversations went. Before we do that, I'm gonna ask um, Jen to sort of share some of her ideas about why she thinks um, uh, why she thinks the field of paleontology is um, as eclectic as it is um, and, and is able to sort of attract uh, characters like the one that you've heard, the ones you've heard about in this book. So any, anybody who knows paleontologists, and I see several on here who definitely know, know that we are an eclectic group um, and we're pretty wild and crazy. And I think part of that is Again, we have to be MacGyvers. You have to be very creative in this field. It doesn't matter if you're taking fossils out of the field, prepping them, storing them, researching them. You, you have things and these problems that you, you know, you're like, okay, I've got a two ton block, I've got to move, how do I do this? So it requires you to kind of become a jack of all trades. So, you know, I need to know how to do plaster, how to dig, how to drive a truck off road, how to, you know, all these different things, chemistry, physics, how to program computer stuff, um, just to do this one job. So it, it, it's really a good field for people who like dabbling in different things, who tend to be people who are very eclectic and, you know, have big personalities. Um, the other thing is we tend to attract a lot of people who are interested in the arts. Um, artists are the best preparators. They have great eye for color and texture differences and they have a steady hand. We do a lot of molding and casting and putty work. Artists, when we open in 2022, if you want to come volunteer, let me know. Um, but artists are also how the public views our fossils. So they're not going to view how the paleontologist drew a T-Rex. They're going to say, oh, this is the artist reconstruction. Um, and so we do get a lot of paleo artists are just artists in general who are interested in paleontology. I know of plenty of people who have an art background who work in fossil preparation labs. And we all know artists are also a very eclectic and, you know, jacks of all trades kind of people because you're also dealing with, okay, how do I reconstruct an ancient ecosystem that we don't know what it really looked? We don't know the color. We don't know this. We don't know that. Um, so you have to think outside the box too. So you're bringing together all these people that are MacGyvering their way through work and you're going to get some characters when you have to do that. Um, just because that's the nature of the job. You're also sending us out to the middle of nowhere. You know, if you're in a country that you don't speak the language, you got to say, I need plaster and burlap. Like, how am I going to convey to this person? I need plaster and burlap, you know? How, I, I did um, geology field school in Turkey and like 
teaching the kids what an earthquake was. They looked at us like we were nuts because we had this limited Turkish and we're like, how do you, we said we're going to rock school and they're like, we don't believe you're going to rock school. So it's also just that, you know, getting out of these situations, you know, I'm in the middle of the Egyptian desert and I need a tire for my car and I need to explain that I'm digging dinosaur bones, but I don't speak Arabic. <laughs> you know, it's, it's those kind of situations. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's helpful. And I think that um, the other thing that's fun for me in terms of being able to read about all of these different scientists is the idea that the field is welcoming um, of folks from many different backgrounds. And I think, as I understand, um, hearing more um, from Dr. Rossetti talk and hearing more from you that the field um, is becoming kind of more diverse over time. Yeah, and even in throughout history, there's been a lot of famous paleontologists that you know, we're not the norm for science. So, you know, the kind of classic example is Mary Anning. You know, that's time when women, you didn't do science. And here she is getting species named after her and people fighting over her specimens. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stories. And we're learning, again, as we're being able to come more globally, we're learning more stories of these eclectic people from all different kinds of backgrounds who really were helping with these different branches of the science. And so we're seeing just how diverse our, our special group of eclectic scientists have been throughout history. Yeah, Kristen just put a link to um, a recent documentary that was on Nat Geo um, about Mary Anning. So that's in the, in the chat box if you'd like to check that later. So Bill, I know you had your hand up. Let's go ahead and kind of hear your question or comment, or if you wanna share a little bit about your small group, that's great. And then we'll go to someone else if you'd like to talk about what you chatted about related to what makes these scientists so interesting. So Bill, go sure. ahead. Okay, so I have two or three little questions. So uh, your guest was mentioning that in upstate New York, there are the, the glaciers took out away the fossils and all that. And uh, I know that like in, in the area of Washington, D.C., there are areas uh, where they found dinosaur tracks in some of the um, canal areas and rocky areas. And I think it's curious that they would have dinosaur tracks in Washington, Washington D.C., but not in anything up in New York. So that was one question. Um, the second question would be um, regarding you know, you, you have legitimate paleontologists getting dinosaur skeletons and finding them and putting them in museums. And then we have uh, the fringe religious people putting like a, a legitimate dinosaur into like the Creation Museum in near Cincinnati. And um, it's confusing the public and, and um, just trying to like rewrite history or something, or I don't know what, if there's anything that can be done about that. And then the third question would be how that some fossils are squishy and don't fossilize. So um, like if, for instance, if you had like uh, fossils like Indiana geodized um, crinoids, um, I have a few geodized crinoids. And then, um, oh, here's another one. And then I have a curious um, fossil, which, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I think it was some kind of a creature. And it, I'm guessing it might be a cuttlefish. So I don't know if that's anything we can guess about at this time or not. But it was, I think it was probably a squishy thing. And it was found in Park County in, in Sugar Creek. So I don't know why that the squishy thing would, would geodize and, and be preserved. So that's three questions. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> I'll try you pick you pick from the list. You take what you like. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll do cliff notes. So first off, uh, glaciers didn't quite go far as DC, and we do have some dinosaur fossils in New York. We have uh, footprints. If you remember from the book, the Palisades, but they're all the way down in southern New York. And there is like a actually that Kinder Hook shop they had some, which was pretty cool. But that's all the way down. It's Triassic. When if you remember from the book, we didn't have many dinosaurs. And there's just footprints. A lot of the first footprints from North America were found in that uh, Newark super group that he talks about. And they were the Raven's footprints, which actually ties into your, your next question. Um, and that's one of those where, you know, every, anybody can collect fossils. Um, they're, it, depending on where the land is, as long as you've done it correctly, you're allowed to collect fossils. Um, the thing is what, and I know this is hard for, for 
average day people, and I have it from medicine, right? The same thing happens for medicine. Anybody can put something up about what they think for medicine and they can say that it's research, right? So we, you have to be careful and you have to look at your resources. So the best I can say is if you're looking at stuff for, for dinosaurs, look at who it's coming from. So we, I did a, a course when I was at Temple University where we had the students and they had to look up articles and they had to say whether or not it's a, a liable article based on where is it published, who's the person writing the article, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, if you, if you have the time to do that, then I would say, go ahead and do that to see who is publishing it, where it's found, all that kind of stuff. Um, but of course, not everybody has that time. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes no matter what people are going to see what they want. So they're like, oh, I want it to be this. And other fields in science are the same way. I'm not going to pretend that paleontology is the only one, but if they're like, oh, this is what I, it says, because this is what proves me right, then people are going to stick to that to the day they die. Um, and it's not just a religion versus a science thing. There's plenty of paleontologists who are like, nope, this is the thing. I don't care what you say, because I proved it in 1954, and darn it, it's going to be the right thing. Um, so that's just that's just in general. And again, it's not just paleontology. There's plenty of fields. Again, we've, we're all seeing it right now with COVID with the medical field about being careful about where you're seeing your sources as far as what people are saying about uh, evidence, you know, say, showing the same chart and one person saying this, another person saying that, but it's the same with paleo. Um, and then for quick on the, on the last one, squishy things can fossilize. If you want it identified, I'd say, um, you know, when we open back up in 2022, come on down to the lab. We're always welcoming people to show us their, their fossils and identify them for them and also their skeletons. We've had some interesting Indiana modern fauna come <laughs> via our window. But yeah, if you're, if you're under, interested, again, unfortunately we're closed right now, but 2022, come on down and we'd be more than happy to identify it for you. Thank you, Jen, that's really helpful. So I've got, um, I'm looking at the time. I've got one more turn and talk question that I wonder if we can kind of sneak in here at the end, and then we'll bring everybody back to have some conversation with Jen. So um, <clears throat> my last turn and talk question is about sort of why this book. So um, my question for all of you is why is uh, telling, why is the origin story of dinosaurs worth telling today? Um, and I think that there are, the author gives us some answers, and I, I think that Jen probably has some answers, but I want to put that in the chat for you. That's your last turn and talk question. It'll be a relatively short one. I'll bring you back in about five minutes. Why is the origin story of dinosaurs worth telling? So we'll head into breakout rooms one last time, and then I'll have you back here in about five minutes or so. And again, if anybody chooses to stay in the main room, you'll just hear answers to questions twice. All right. So Jen, um, what do you think about this book? Why do you think that this story is worth telling right now? I mean, one of the things I remember as I was listening to interviews with Steve um, was the idea that he had been working on this book for a long time. And so I'm interested to hear kind of your thoughts about why, um, and I guess this book is a couple of years old, but why maybe right now might be an interesting time for a book like this to come out. I think there's a couple things. One, um, there was kind of this golden age of paleo kind of when I was growing up and I, I really like that this book came out because it shows the newer generation of paleontologists. Um, it also shows a much more diverse group. So I really liked that he was highlighting these places that you don't typically think of, of paleontology, but also different people from that country who do paleontology. Because again, I think we're, we're very kind of Western centric and it was really good to see all of these paleontologists from around the world who are working in their fields, so to show how diverse the field actually is. Um, and then lastly, just kind of uh, this idea that we're still learning new things. So, you know, the, the Barasaurus skeleton that he worked at, that's been up at the AM and H since I was a kid, but they're able to do new stuff with it. Um, so it's kind of that combination of seeing that there is new blood in paleo. So don't worry kids, there's 
there's youngins out there doing it. Like it's all work to be done. Reason. Yeah. Um, and it was, I mean, it was great to actually see people that I've worked with instead of being like, yeah, I remember seeing him on TV when I was five. It was, it was great to see that, um, to see the diversity of paleontologists in the field and the diverse places that you find fossils and having all those fun stories of these paleontologists really working to, it's their heritage, right? Really getting their, their heritage out there, um, which is a big thing right now for paleo. It was a big thing in archeology span a while back. It's becoming a big thing in paleo about of showing your, you know, your pride in your fossils. Um, and then just showing all these new techniques that are available and how that is changing our views that this isn't a, a very static, kind of thing that just because they're old fossils doesn't mean that you have to have old views that you can be constantly changing how you look at things. I think for me that whole you know um evolution of perspective um the other reason for me why I think and sort of why I think this question is important is the relationship between this work and climate change mm -hmm. that for me as I read this book I I was constantly thinking about you know um kind of the long, very, very long arc of history, right? And that when we say the long arc of history, we're usually talking about human history, but seeing history kind of from this perspective. And I think that, um, you know, Brissetti does a really good job of um, helping us put some perspective on just how young humans are in comparison. And, um, just the extent to which the, the extent of the damage that we know we've done in that in that time. Yeah, I mean, paleo is the ultimate long term experiment, right? right? So paleontology has been used to to kind of show what changes in climate can do. I know that's the big focus of um, the new Smithsonian fossil galleries is how we can use the past to interpret what might happen with the future with climate change. Uh, it shows that just because you're dominant doesn't mean you stay on top which is a very big lesson for humans. Um, and, you know, fossils have been used for, for other long-term experiments. So for instance, um, how do you store rad waste? I have a friend who studies uranium storage and fossils are really good at sucking up uranium. How do they keep uranium st sturdy for 150 million years? So they're also kind of helping us, you know, well, now you have all this rad waste. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to safely store it? And you're like, well, we can't set up an experiment that long. Oh, wait, Mother Nature already has. So um, using fossils is kind of the past is key to the present kind of thing, or present is key to the past. So we always say that, you know, present key past. We go both ways in paleo. And really, this idea of faunal change. And, you know, I, I love the, the big one there is the crocodile morse, where you're, they're like, if you look at this, it makes no sense why dinosaurs would survive. Absolutely not. Um, and then I also like, you know, from the climate change thing, he's like, so to give you an idea, this little bit did all this, this is what we've done, right? And it, it kind of makes you think like, oh yeah. Cause I was like, oh, I could use some hotter weather. Like Indiana could afford to be, you know, 80 in the winter. No, no, it really couldn't. Then we'd be underwater and it wouldn't be a good time. Yeah, I think that that is one of, to me, one of the powerful sort of perspectives about, about this book. All right, I'm going to bring everybody back and um, we'll talk about that as a whole group. Again, always happy to have you back in the main room. Thanks for coming back. I um, am always like I said, sad to bring everybody back because I'm sure that you're having great conversations in your breakout rooms. Um, Jen and I had a great conversation here in the main room. We'll talk about it here in a minute and then hopefully have some time for all of your questions. We'll get everybody back here in just about 30 seconds or so. Jen, I'm really proud of myself for staying on time tonight. I'm usually terrible about it. We only had to skip one question. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. Looks like folks are coming back. Thank you so much. Um, we'll get started here in just a minute and hear kind of some of your perspectives and then have time for questions for Jen. I'm trying to make sure my New York doesn't show and I don't speak too fast. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I um. I'm always accused of speaking too quickly in these, so I, I'm right there with you. 
Uh, it's one of the nice things about the chat, right? At least with the chat, I can give everybody the question again so that when you head into your breakout rooms, you've got a good question to work from. So um, Jenna and I hung out in the main room here and I asked her kind of what she thought was the most important thing about telling this story and kind of why right now, why is it important to tell this sort of, sort of origin story of dinosaurs? And Jen, you had a couple of ideas about the field and about how things have changed in the field. Do you wanna say more about that? So I was mentioning um, there was kind of this golden age for paleo outreach kind of when I was a kid and you keep seeing the same old white guys over and over and over and over again. And it was still, I mean, even now kids know Jack Horner. Um, so I really liked that this book had kind of the newer generation of paleontologists. So you could see that it's still a field that, you know, we didn't stop back in the nineties. We still have people coming. It was great to see people I actually have worked with in there um, to see, you know, the diversity of people in the field. So I really liked that he highlighted places that you don't think of when you think of fossil finds and also the local paleontologists there because it's it's becoming a really big thing to, to make sure we highlight that there are paleontologists from these different countries and they're doing a lot of work in their field, in their country um, to kind of bring, bring paleontology more globally. Um, and then to highlight how much new information we're still learning from all these old fossils. So I give the example, he mentions the Barosaurus at the American Museum of Natural History. I mean, that's been up since I was a kid. And the fact that they're still saying, oh, well, there's still stuff we can learn from it. Let's bring it on over and do something different to it so we can learn more information. Um, so I just kind of really liked this book highlighted, you know, we're not still stuck in the 90s. Here's all the different, the new, generation of paleontologists, the different places we're finding fossils, the different techniques, and kind of bringing people back to see, oh, okay, so, you know, it is still this field that's constantly evolving and introducing new people and greater diversity of techniques and the people who are going into the field. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, so before, Bill, we take your question, let's see if we can get some um, sort of summary from some of the small groups to hear your conversations about this origin story and why it might be worth telling right now. So if your group had a great conversation and you'd like to sort of share that with the group, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand tool or you could just old school raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but I'd love to hear about how your small group conversations went and why you think this story is worth telling right now. Go ahead, Kim. We thought that the story was worth telling because of basically how much the world changes and how we are changing the whole concept of change and how it how it is con a continual process and how things you well know, the dinosaur origin story actually came out of um, a catastrophe story itself. Um, so where they had a massive die, 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 um, die off and then the, the dinosaurs filled in those niches and the change is still such a our world is an ever-changing place, and that's why we thought it was a um, important thing to study the origins of the dinosaurs. Did anybody else have anything to add from my group on that? That's about it. <laughs> so I, I felt the same thing. I felt like the the climate change imperative that comes with uh, you know telling a story like this is really important. And Jen, you mentioned I'm pointing to you like like everybody. She's probably not a bit location on your screen, um, that um, you said that the Smithsonian exhibit has sort of changed. Can you talk about that just very briefly? Yeah, so um, if anybody has had the luck to see the new Smithsonian exhibit, which I have not, but that is a big part in their exhibit. And it's a lot, it's becoming a lot more involved in paleo experience because how do you do a long-term experiment? How can you say, oh, what could the earth look like in a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, a million years? Well, we have fossils. So they can show us, hey, you raise the temperature by five degrees Celsius, this is what happens. Um, you know, it also is a nice humbling pie because you can say, Here, here's the dominant group. They have all these different species. They're on every, all the continents, including Antarctica. That doesn't mean you're invincible. Um, so their fossils become a really good experiment when you're trying to figure out how do you do these very long-term experiments because nobody's going to set up an experiment that's going to last for a million years. Um, but we have fossils. Mother Nature already did that for us. So uh, more and more fossil exhibits are tying that in to show, hey, 
How do we know that raising temperatures are probably not a good idea? Let's show you all the periods during geologic history where that happened and what were the consequences for these various groups of animals. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for the, those insights. And I'm excited to see that Smithsonian exhibit once we open up again. That sounds like it'll be really fun. Um, so Bill, you have a question and then we'll open it up for questions for Jen from the whole group. Go ahead, Bill. Hi, uh, so I have maybe a couple of questions. You know, um, the, the paleontologist uh, Paul Serino of, of Chicago has made many, many famous discoveries and I hadn't really heard anything much about him lately. So I didn't know if he was still active or if he's still going on expeditions and finding things. That's the first question. And um, let's see the other question. Um, let's see. Well, while you're thinking of it, Bill, there's another question in the chat. So we'll take that one as well. That is, um, Rose asks about the dig site in Wyoming and its relationship to the Children's Museum. So if you could, Jen, maybe answer Bill's first question and then switch over to Rose's question in the chat. Yep. So Paul Serena is still doing work. He, he is one of those people that classifies as a character. I think it's mentioned in the book. He made like the, what, the top, top, whatever men, sexiest men under 40 or whatever. That's Paul, like that pretty much sums up Paul. Um, but like any scientist, he's kind of like taking the back burner and letting his students do, do more stuff and gets to pick his projects. I'm pretty sure he's tenured by now. So he's kind of enjoying those, those good old days. Um, as far as the, the dig site, so in 2017, we switched from digging in South Dakota, which was 66 million year old rock and mostly in Mosasaurus, which is a duck billed dinosaur, to digging in Wyoming which is 150 million year old rock. And we're dealing mostly with sauropods. So those are the long neck dinosaurs, like the ones bursting out and looking into the museum. Um, we're dealing with dinosaurs that get as big as two T-Rexes, so 80 to 90 feet long. Um, we had the hip section of our dinosaur, so it's including the rock and the jacket, weighed 3,600 pounds to give you an idea of the size of these things. Um, we jokingly discussed that the fossils are my size versus I have a pair of named Taylor who's close to six foot. So are they gen size or tailor size? If <laughs> we go on that. Uh, but every summer the Children's Museum goes out and we dig more fossils. Um, we work with the University of Manchester, which is my home mater, and uh, the Naturalist Biodiversity Museum in the Netherlands. Um, the past couple of years we've been digging mostly to get fossils out for display because in 2022 we will be opening uh, two new galleries and a third that is kind of getting a facelift. Um, and that's going to include two of these sauropods, two of these long-necked dinosaurs, um, some footprints, because our site also has footprints, um, and some marine fossils, because we also have, uh, there was a seaway in there called the Sundance Sea. Um, so uh, we have ichthyosaurs, which are those things that look kind of like a marlin and a dolphin got together. Um, we have one of those guys. Uh, we get a bunch of different kinds of fossils, and I'm sad to say, because we've been digging so many fossils, we have over a thousand fossils from the one quarry alone, um, we haven't gotten to explore the whole mile. We have a square mile, so I'm very excited to see what other fossils we can find. But we found um, several different species of sauropod. There are about 11 different ones known from that area of uh, the Morrison Formation, which is the rock we're working in. We found hundreds of shed teeth of meat-eating dinosaurs. Uh, we've got pathologic elements, which I'm ex super excited about, some messed up bones. Um, we've got uh, fabric bit of crocodile, we've got a fish, we've got plant fossils, we've got all kinds of things. So I joke that it's it's a site that keeps everybody happy. So if you don't like dinosaurs, there's plants. If you don't like plants, there's some other reptiles. If you don't like them, there's some marine fossils. Um, and so yeah, we go out every summer collecting new stuff. Uh, this summer we're gonna keep collecting and we're also gonna explore more of that mile. And, see what other cool critters we might find. I'm, I'm hoping for a Ceratosaurus and a Stegosaurus. So that's one of my wish So list. exciting. It sounds like we have lots of fun things to see at the Children's Museum in the next few years. So we have time for one more question. Anthony, go ahead, you get the floor. Awesome, thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Jennifer. This question goes back to your, your subfield in um, disease, dinosaur disease. Can you talk about that a little more and, you know, what were some of the diseases and did any of them make the leap post dinosaur? So I think what drew, what really drew me to paleopathology, by the way, is that I think a lot of people forget that these were living things. We see them as the skeletons and 
just think of them as sculptures. So I like pathologies because it showed that, you know, 70 million years ago, this animal had a really bad day and it kind of makes them an individual and makes them a living thing. Um, so they, there's a whole bunch of different things that have been diagnosed in dinosaurs. They're very challenging to diagnose because uh, as you learn from the book, they're kind of birds, but not quite birds. So when you're looking at the veterinary literature, which already doesn't really care about reptiles or birds, um, you're trying to figure out what it could be because there's some things you're like, well, if it's a reptile, it would be this, but if it was a bird, it would be this. And you're like, it's somewhere in between, I don't know. Um, but there's, there's cases of arthritis, of osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection, plenty of uh, different fractures. Um, there's cancers recorded in, in fossils, um, septic arthritis. Um, we have possibly a bucked shin in our one sauropod, which is something that apparently um, horses that, that do jumping competition get a lot. So I have a lot of veterinary friends where I'm like, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and they help out with that. But there's a there's a whole slew of different injuries. And actually, if you're interested, our Gorgosaurus has a lot. And I'm hoping to be able to look at that animal more um, now that we've had to take all of the fossils off of display to make sure they're safe. But I mean, that, that Gorgosaurus has something like, I don't know, like 20 different injuries <laughs> um, from fused caudals to a fibula that's actually it's forming a J, so in life it might have been sticking out of the skin um, to like losing teeth in the front jaw, so probably would have been drooling a lot. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things. And we also have, if anybody visits right now, we have um, Bucky the T-Rex and Sue the T-Rex out. And Sue's got like, I think like the third or fourth most pathologies of any dinosaur, including on her, her one humerus or on an upper arm bone, she has a muscle avulsion where the muscle actually pulled off of the bone. Um, so there's a lot of, I'm getting, I'm geeking out now, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of really cool things. And uh, this is one of those things where originally you could just kind of look at, at it from the outside because nobody wanted to let you cut it up. But now that we have micro CT that can penetrate through that, that dense rock, we're able to better diagnose. But I always give the caveat of like, if you went to the doctor or something, you hope that they're going to do multiple tests before they tell you what you have. I just have a skeleton and it's 70 million years. <laughs> so usually I can say, it's probably this. Well, and that gives us lots of opportunities, as you said, to kind of keep learning from all the great work that you're doing at the Children's Museum. Um, thank you all for your engagement tonight. Um, I'm so sorry that we're out of time. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Jen Ine for being with us and always being a great supporter of Books, Booze, and Brains. I'm always happy to have you on the planning committee. Thank you so much for your hard work. And also thank you for being our featured guest tonight. Um, we would love to see all of you back on uh, April 27th, um, again, the last Tuesday of the month. Um, our book for next month is called Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Ciani. And our featured guest is one of my colleagues at Indiana University School of Medicine, Bronson Tucker Edmonds, who is an OBGYN and a health services researcher. And she looks specifically at the issues of health disparities in communities of color. So um, a nice different kind of shift to go from the ancient world to some of the challenges we're facing today, but I think we're gonna have an equally engaging discussion. Again, same location, same Zoom room. Um, we'll be happy to have you back April 27th. Thanks again to all of our great hosts and partners, Indiana Sciences, Indiana Humanities, and Central Indiana Science Outreach. Krista Hoffman-Longton, see you back next month. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>